Hope that you do. Open your Bible with me to John chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 60 through 71 this morning. And we are continuing our focus on this incredible man in the Bible, Simon Peter. And, and the theme of this study is like a rock because uh, Jesus said that Simon, who was a man very common, just like us, would become like a rock. He would be the rock upon which he would build his church. And so we're focusing on this man, Simon Peter, and, and his spiritual journey. And this morning as we open God's Word to John chapter 6, I want to share with you about the tragedy of temporary disciples. If you've been a believer for a length of time, it's likely that you've encountered some temporary disciples. Unfortunately, they've, been, they've become fairly common in the church today. Temporary disciples portray a commitment to Christ and his church for a season, but only for a season. The time comes when they abandon their walk with him and they return to the world. I think we've all seen people like that. Unfortunately, in, in, in ministry, we encounter people that we lead to Christ, we baptize, we think that, that they're sincere about their commitment to Christ, but in time, it becomes obvious that their commitment to Christ was not deep, it was not real, it was not genuine. Well, in our text this morning, we're going to see a time where Peter and the 12 disciples encountered some temporary disciples. Uh, let me give you a little bit of the background. If you look at John chapter 6, the whole chapter, you'll see that Jesus had just fed the 5,000. The 5,000 that were following him, uh, he fed them miraculously. It was a miraculous feeding. He took a little boy's lunch of fish and loaves and multiplied the food. And he miraculously fed that ginormous crowd, 5,000 men. There, there were women, there were children there as well. And when he fed the 5,000 with that little lunch, they wanted to make Jesus king. I mean, they were ready to coronate him, crown him king, make him the leader that they thought would be that leader that would overthrow the Roman government. But Jesus didn't want to have any of that. He did not come to be that kind of king or that kind of Messiah. So he sent the crowds away. He sent the disciples away because he did not want them to get caught up in that idea of him being an earthly king. And you'll remember last week that he sent them in a boat to go to the other side of the sea, to go back over to the west side, back to Capernaum. And when they got in the boat, the storm came up and they were, thought they were in peril of losing their lives, but Jesus walked on the water and came to them. And when the boat got to the other side, it came to Gennesaret, which was three miles from Capernaum, Jesus' hometown. And there again, the crowds began to follow him. Those on the other side of the sea were like, how did you get here? They were wondering, how did Jesus get over here to the other side of the sea? They knew he didn't get in the boat with the 12. Uh, some of them, I don't know if they ever figured that one out. They didn't know that Jesus walked on the water to get to the other side of the sea. And that's right, children, Jesus Christ walked on water on the Sea of Galilee to the other side of the sea. And, and then there were those that came and Jesus did some more miracles. And, and when he got to Capernaum, he began to teach them. And as he was teaching them, they wanted him to do more miracles. And, and he used the occasion to tell them, I am the bread of life. He said, what you're really seeking is not the bread I fed you with on the other side of the sea. He said, but I am the bread of life. This is one of the great I am statements of the Bible. He said, I am the bread of life. I am the one that if you eat the bread that I'll offer you, you will never hunger again. I am the answer to your salvation. I am the answer to your purpose in life. I am the answer to you being reconciled with God. I'm the answer. And they said, well, if you're telling us that, then we want to see you do some more miracles. And so Jesus then said, if you don't believe, I'm, I'm not going to perform any more miracles, but, it, but if you're going to be saved, you have to eat this bread. 
He said, you've got to eat this bread that I'm offering you. And he, he got a little bit more graphic with them, and he used images of what we know as the Lord's Supper. And I'm not going to get that graphic in our family service today. But he got, Jesus got graphic. And, and he said, you've got to eat this bread. You've got to drink the sacrifice that I'm making. And, and, and for them, they had not shared the Lord's Supper yet. So, so the speak that Jesus was giving them some hard words that were very difficult to understand. We understand them because we understand communion and the Lord's Supper. But when he spoke these words, they didn't understand them. And, and, and so we're going to see that the words that Jesus spoke caused many of the people that were following him to turn away. And so the main idea I want to share with you this morning is that a temporary disciple is not a true disciple. A temporary disciple is not a true disciple of Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me to honor the reading of God's Word? And we're going to pick up reading in chapter 6, verse 60. It says, When many of the disciples heard these words that Jesus had spoke, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, Do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, Did I not, did I not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your words. Thank you for the words of Jesus that are always true. And God, I pray that you would give us ears to hear what the Spirit would say to us, your church today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So a temporary disciple is not a true disciple. And temporary disciples is not just a 21st century problem. It was a 1st century problem. I mean, we see it right here in our text that there, there were many of the larger crowd of the disciples that were following Jesus that, that when Jesus spoke words that were hard for them to hear, they turned and walked away. And, and, and so being a temporary disciple is something that happened in the 1st century and it's something that we see in the 21st century all the time. There are many today, thousands of people that are walking away from Christ, walking away from the church, walking away from the truth of God's word to go back and walk in the philosophies that are in the world today. We're seeing that happen all around us. Well, there are three things that, that I want you to learn with me today from God's word about temporary disciples. Number one, they are easily discouraged. They were easily discouraged by the words of Jesus here in our text. They had seen Jesus feed 5,000. They had already seen miracles. They had seen Jesus healing. They were hearing about Jesus walking on the water. And, and yet still, they're so easily discouraged. Notice one of, the, one of these that are a, a temporary disciple can be discouraged by false expectations. I think many of that larger crowd that following him had false expectations about who the Messiah was going to be. Back when he fed the 5,000, they wanted to make him king. What kind of king did they want to make him? An earthly king, right? I mean, their idea of the Messiah 
was, was to be one that would come and, and be powerful and lead the Jewish people to revolt against the evil Roman government and, and overthrow that government and, and, and reestablish the nation of Israel as the supreme nation again that it once was in the time of David. That was their idea of the Messiah. And Jesus is constantly teaching them that that's not the kind of Messiah that I came to be. And they said, well, show us more miracles. Do, do some more miracles for us. You see, beloved, the same thing today is many people in the church today have false expectations about who Christ is. And, and sometimes preachers that are preaching are giving people those false expectations. We, we have an entire uh, denomination of, of people today that are following preachers that teach a prosperity doctrine that says that if you follow Jesus and give us your money, then Jesus is going to make you healthy and wealthy and you're never going to get sick and you're, you're going to have financial wealth. And, and many people come to Christ with that expectation. And beloved, can I just tell you as a church, and you know this, that's a false expectation? To, for us to think as believers that we're never going to get sick? I, I mean, that is, that's ridiculous. Are we going to get sick? Yeah, I haven't met a believer yet that hasn't died, right? I, I mean, we're, we're all going to die. I mean, one of these days we're all going to get sick. One of these days something is going to give us that wonderful privilege of getting to go to heaven. And, and, and for us to think that our loved ones are never going to get sick and never going to go through struggles here on this side, that's a false expectation. If you're following Christ because you think he's going to make you healthy and wealthy, that's a false expectation. Now, will he reconcile you to God the Father? Yeah, absolutely. That's why he came. Will he take away all your sins so that you can be forgiven? Yeah, absolutely. Will he give, will he give your life purpose and meaning? Yes, absolutely. We, will he fill that void in your life that, that is emptiness and, and, and there's nothing that can fill it but him? Yeah, that's what the bread of life is. The bread of life is what fills that void. But nowhere in the scripture does it ever say that if you follow Jesus, you're never going to have troubles, you're never going to have problems, you're never going to get sick, and, and that you're always going to drive a, a Cadillac Suburban and live in a mansion. It doesn't say that in Scripture. And yet there are many people that have that idea. And when, when things don't turn out the way they thought, they, they fall away because they were led to have false expectations of who Jesus was. A second thing is one can be discouraged by feeling offended. I've seen people drop out of church because they got angry because some prayer didn't get answered, they weren't answered. That's false expectation. I've seen others that drop out of church because of being offended by something that was said. The Word of God is sometimes offensive to our carnal nature. Are you okay with that? I mean, the Word of God steps on our toes. The Word of God brings conviction of sin. There, there are things in the Word of God that, that you and your carnal nature are not going to like. And, and when we preach those things, sometimes we're going to be offended. I've preached numerous times on certain subjects that people are, that are not popular today, and I've literally seen people get up in this congregation and walk out of the room. Now, most of the time, they're a guest. They're not members here. Uh, because most of you that are members here, you, you, you know the word. You want the whole word of God preach, but some people don't. But there are people today that are easily offended by the word of God. And Jesus, if these words that he spoke about eating the bread and drinking his sacrifice, if those words offended that crowd... Well, Jesus has got some more words that are even going to be more offensive that are coming a little bit later. Like Luke chapter 9, verse 23 and 24, when he said, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. A cross in those days 
was a hideous image, an image of of suffering and death of a common criminal. And Jesus saying, if you're going to follow me, you've got to pick up your cross and you've got to be willing to die to yourself on that cross. Those are pretty strong words. In Luke chapter 9, verse 59 through 62, Jesus said to another one, he said, follow me. And the guy said, well, Lord, let me first go bury my father. Seems like a reasonable request. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go preach the kingdom of God. Wow. That's pretty strong, right? That's pretty offensive. I mean, I'm saying, well, Jesus, I want to follow you, but my dad is aging and he needs me to to be his caregiver and and I'm going to stick around and take care of him and then I'll follow you. And Jesus said, no, no, no. Let the dead bury the bed. You follow me. I mean, that may even still be offensive to us today, right? Maybe you're sitting here thinking, did Jesus really say that? Yeah, it's there. Look at it in your Bible. He, He said to another, another said to him, Lord, I will follow you. But let me first go bid farewell to those who are in my house. And Jesus said to him, No one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Wow. In in Matthew chapter 10, verse 37 through 38, get this. Jesus said, He who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Beloved, those are the words of Jesus. So they only thought they were offended now, right? I mean, just wait. I mean, the words of Jesus are even going to be more offensive in the days ahead. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying to us that when we decide that we are going to follow him as Savior and Lord, that that means that we die to everything, that we die to self to follow him, that we surrender everything to him. And that is what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. John MacArthur said about that passage, he said, false disciples are curiosity seekers who are superficially attracted to Christ. But when he makes demands on them, or there is a cost to be paid for following him, they disappear, desiring neither to, to go of the, of the world, nor to deny themselves. False disciples do not follow Christ because of who he is, but because of what they want from him. Let me say that again. They follow him not because of who he is, but because of what they want from him. They are thrill seekers, not truth seekers. A lot of people today are looking for churches that will never preach the hard sayings of Christ, that never even read the verses that I just read to you, that love to come to the great Sunday morning event where they hear a sermon about how wonderful they are and and engage in some outstanding worship and never be challenged to make the ultimate sacrifice for Jesus Christ. Beloved, that's what Memorial Day is all about, right? It's about those that made the ultimate sacrifice for our country. For our country. Yeah, it is an incredible respectful thing to make the ultimate sacrifice for our country but beloved we are called to make the ultimate sacrifice for something far greater than our country right we're making the ultimate sacrifice for our lord and savior jesus christ we are to be willing to die for him if necessary but every day we are to die to self To live for him. Are you easily discouraged by false expectations, by being offended? Number two, notice this. They are prone to disbelief. They're they're prone to doubt and disbelief. In verse 63, Jesus said, It's the spirit who gives life. It is no help at all. The flesh is no help at all. He said, The words that I speak to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning 
who would not believe him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless granted by the Father. Beloved, do you realize that Jesus' words, Jesus said, my words are spirit. So, so the, the word of God, the Bible, is not a physical book, is it? It, it, it may look like one. It may look like paper and ink. But, but do you realize that this is a spiritual book? This is a spiritual book. Are you with me? These are the words of God. And when the word of God is read, when the word of God is preached, when the word of God is taught, there's power. The spirit is working. The spirit is active in the words of Christ that he spoke. My words are spirit and my words are life. What does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit brings life. Life out of death, life out of deadness. And what is it that does that? The Word of God. That is why reading the Word of God, memorizing the Word of God, meditating on the Word of God, hearing the Word of God taught and preached is so vital because our flesh can profit nothing. We'll never be able to live for God in the flesh, only as we are activated by the Spirit. And we can't even come to God in the flesh. Jesus said, if you look over in, in John 6, 44, he said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. And he said that again there in verse 65. This is why I told you no one can come to me unless granted by the Father. In salvation, there is the work of the witness... That's me and you. We, we're the witness. We're the evangelist. We share the good news of Christ. We tell people the good news that Christ died on the cross for their sin because he loves you even as a sinner. And if you would put your faith in him, his death, burial, and resurrection, you could be saved. Well, when I share that simple, powerful message, then the Trinity of God, the entire Trinity of God, steps in action. The Holy Spirit takes the gospel... And the gospel, the Bible says, is the power of God into salvation. And the Holy Spirit begins to convict all of us of our sin, that we are sinners. That we are sinners who've sinned against the holy God. We cannot save ourselves. The Spirit goes to work. And then the Father goes to work. As the Spirit convicts us of our sin, God the Father draws us to his Son, Jesus Christ. And as the Father draws us to his Son... If we put our faith in his son, then Jesus is the one who brings salvation. He saves us. The spirit convicts us. The father draws us. Jesus saves us. And, and, and that all happens as we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But here, this crowd, they were prone to disbelief. And the Bible says that many of them turn to walk away. You know, I'm a, <clears throat> I'm a firm believer in the doctrine that we cherish called the doctrine of eternal security. I believe in that. I preach that. I can, I can take you through Scripture and show you that incredible doctrine of eternal security. When properly understood, the doctrine of eternal security brings joy and peace and blessing, security to every believer. When that doctrine is misunderstood, however, it can be incredibly dangerous and damnable doctrine because there are many people that take the doctrine of eternal security or as sometimes it's called once saved, always saved, and they'll say, well, I remember a time in my life when, when I... I walked down to the front of a service and I prayed a prayer and I signed a card and I got wet in, in some water and, and, and therefore I am saved and I have eternal security. And even though I've lived like a pagan for the remainder of my life and have never been in church and have never followed Jesus, I'm going to heaven. But, but that's the idea that many people have Related to the eternal security of the believer. 
And that is a flat-out lie. That is deception. That is not what the eternal security of the believer means. The eternal security of the believer only applies to someone who is a genuine, born-again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that, that, that is not just walking an aisle, signing a card, and getting wet in a baptistry. The only way, really, that sometimes we know if we are genuine believers is the fruit that comes and the change that comes in our life after that genuine salvation. If we are genuinely saved, we can never be the same. If we are genuinely saved, the Holy Spirit is going to produce fruit in our life. And can a genuine believer have lapses of commitment? Can there be times that we fall into sin, make mistakes, and fall away for a season? Absolutely. But if you're a genuine believer, the Holy Spirit is going to bring conviction. God the Father is going to draw you back and even discipline you. And and Christ is going to hang on to you. He's never going to let you go. You'll be the most miserable person in the world if you're a genuine believer who's walked away from God. But if you can walk away from God, abandon the faith, be a temporary disciple, and and go years without God in your life, kind of laugh about it and say, well, I'm just one of those backslidden Christians, but I'm going to heaven because I was baptized when I was eight years old. Friend, you are in deception. And and that, that baptism was not real baptism. You just got dunked in water and you've never been saved by the Spirit of God if you can laugh about being a backslidden Baptist. Beloved church, these disciples turned and walked away from Jesus. And Jesus didn't try to stop them from walking away. It revealed their true character. And, and false disciples, temporary disciples are prone to fall back into disbelief. They go to college. They listen to some professor who tries to challenge everything and they get in a culture like a college campus and boy, they immediately buy in hook, line, and sinker to the deception and the immoral life of a college campus. Does that mean that all teenagers that fall into that are temporary disciples? Not all, but some. Time will tell, right? Time will tell. The last thing is they are easily discouraged. They're prone to disbelief. Finally, in closing... <clears throat> they are willing to defect. They're willing to turn and walk away. And here we see that many did. Verse 66, after many of the disciples turned back and no longer walked with him, Jesus said to the 12, to Peter and the 12, do you also want to walk away? Do you also want to go? And then Jesus, then Peter who who was fastly becoming the leader of the disciples, spoke up. And with great wisdom in his words, he gave the great confession before the great confession. This is what I call the great confession before the great confession, right? Next week, we're going to look at the great confession of Peter in Matthew 16, the passage we talk about as his great confession. But this is the great confession before the great confession. Jesus, Peter said, Lord... To whom shall we go? (laughs) I mean, if we walk away, to whom shall we go? He said, you alone have the words of eternal life. And we have come to believe that you are the Holy One of God. Wow. I mean, what an incredible profession of faith. That is that, that profession that says there's nowhere else to turn. There's nobody else that has living bread. There's no one else that paid the price on the cross. There's no one else that can forgive our sin. There's no one else that can give us eternal life in heaven. We know in spite of the fact that sometimes your words are hard and offensive, in spite of sometimes all of our expectations aren't met, we know that you are the Holy One of God. Oh, what a profession. Beloved, that's where many of us are here today, aren't we? I mean, that's where many of us are, children, parents. Can I just tell you this for all of us in this room? Uh, The Christian life is going to bring some disappointments. What I mean by that is there are going to be times our prayers aren't answered the way we wanted them to be answered, and in the flesh, we're going to be disappointed. 
Now, if we knew, if we knew who God is more maturely, we wouldn't be disappointed any time God says no to an answer to prayer because God always has a reason. But in the flesh, honestly, there are going to be times we're disappointed. God doesn't answer a prayer the way we wanted him to. There are times we're going to have expectations that God is not going to meet. There are going to be times that the Word of God brings something to us that is so offensive. I mean, it brings conviction. It's hard. It's a hard saying. But for many of us in this room, our mind is made up, right? That even if Jesus doesn't answer all my prayers the way I want him to, even if I go through things on this earth that I do not understand, even though there are times I read the Bible and it offends me, Who else am I going to turn to? There's nobody else. There's no one in the else that I would rather follow than the person of Jesus Christ who gave his life for me, who reconciles me to God, who gives me eternal life, and who fills me with living bread. Amen? Are you with me, church? We're not going to turn away. Just because our prayers don't always answer the way we want them to. We're not going to turn away just because the world is going one way and the Word of God is leading us another way. We're not going to turn away if the world persecutes us because we believe in what Jesus said in a time when it's not popular to believe in what Jesus said. We are settled, right? We're going to build our lives on the rock of Jesus Christ. And there's no turning back. 1 John chapter 2, verse 19, John explained it. He said, they went out from us. Now look at this. They, these temporary disciples, went out from us. Why? He said, because they were not of us. They were not of us in the first place. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might be complained, that it might be made manifest that they were not of us at all. I mean, John just lays it out there, right? He says the reason they left is because they never were really saved. And if they had been saved, they would have stayed, but they went out so that it would become known that they were never of us in the first place. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 39, the right of Hebrews says, but we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith to the persevering of the soul. In Matthew 24, 13, Jesus said, he who endures to the end shall be saved. He who endures to the end. Doesn't mean we're not going to have moments of sin, of failure, of mistakes, of doubts. But even during those times, God never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He holds on to us when we don't even hold on to him. And he will get us through. The ultimate example of a temporary disciple is seen there in verse 70. Jesus answered them, did I not choose you 12 and yet even one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the 12, was going to betray him. Judas was a temporary disciple. Long, he, he was longer than some of these others that turned away. But in the end, he turned away and betrayed Christ. Jesus said he was of the devil. Jesus said that uh, he, he, he will betray me. And you remember the story of Judas? Judas turned away, became a temporary disciple for 30 pieces of silver. Turned away from Christ for 30 pieces of silver. His expectations that he had were not met, maybe. Maybe Jesus said some things that offended him. So he sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. After he turned away from Jesus, Peter asked the question, to whom shall we go? Remember after Judas turned away from Jesus, there was nowhere else to go. I mean, he had his silver he, he had his money, but, but there, was, there was no bread of life anymore. There was no purpose. There was no meaning. There was no relationship with God. And the Bible says that Judas went out and hung himself. He, he committed suicide. Why did Judas commit suicide? Because the words that Peter said are so true. If we turn away from you, to whom shall we go? 
And the answer is there is nowhere to go. If you turn away from Jesus, there's nowhere to go. If you turn away from Jesus, there's no, there's no other answer. There's no other bread. There's, there's no other savior. There's no other forgiver. There's no other way to God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And there's no other way to heaven except through me. I want to ask you in closing, are you being tempted to turn away from Christ? Is there something that has offended you or some false expectation that has caused you to slip away from your faithfulness that's caused you to think about turning away? Maybe you already have. You're watching online or you're here. Well, I want to ask you this. If you turn away from Christ, to whom shall you go? There's nobody else. Would you pray with me? As we bow our heads before God this morning, I want to invite you to come to Christ if you've never been saved. You may, you may be here and you've heard about Jesus. You've, you know that he died on the cross for your sins, but you've never stepped out in faith to be baptized, to make that profession of your faith in Christ. Some of you children, maybe you've been thinking about it, praying about it with your parents, but you haven't made that commitment yet. I want to, I want to encourage you to make that commitment today. There's nowhere else to go except Jesus. If you want to have God in your life, purpose in your life, there's nowhere else to go today. I invite you to Jesus. Maybe you're here, you've tried everything else. You've tried everything the world has to offer. It's not there. There's nowhere else to go. I pray today that you would come to Jesus. I'm going to pray in a minute. I want to invite you to pray with me. Maybe you're here as a believer. Maybe you've been tempted to fall away from your faithfulness to to step back from your commitment. Oh, I want to encourage you not to do that. I pray like Peter, you'd say, you know, where else, there's nowhere else to go. Maybe, maybe you were offended at something. Maybe you were discouraged by something. But I pray today you'd come to the realization there's nowhere else to go. I, I'm going to come back to Christ, and I'm never going to turn away. No turning back for me. If that's you, the altar will be open up here after we sing or while we're singing. I will invite you to come and get on your knees And just recommit your life to God and say, God, you know what? I don't understand everything, but there's no turning back for me. And if you're here today, you've never accepted Christ as your Savior. You've never been saved and baptized, but you want to be. Would you pray this prayer with me right now? Dear Jesus, I need you. I know that this emptiness in my life, this guilt in my life, that that if, if I'm ever going to be free from this, there's nowhere else to go. There's no one else. There's no religion. That There's nothing I can do except turn to you, Jesus Christ, and put my faith in you, your death, your burial, your resurrection for my salvation. Today, I open my heart to you. I profess my faith in you. And I receive your forgiveness and I receive your gift of eternal life by faith. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Oh, if you prayed that prayer, Hallelujah. Greatest decision you'll ever make. Come and let me know. I'll be right here. If you want to come and let me know right now, I'm going to be standing right here. I'd love to celebrate that with you. Or I'll be at back at Meet the Pastor. And if you prayed that prayer and you want to get baptized, come see me at Meet the Pastor right after this service. Let's talk about it. Beloved church.